What's going on guys? Welcome to Political Fight Club. Now this episode I was uh, promising you guys two days ago and I'm sorry I didn't get it to you till today. I uh, did it yesterday and it turned out to be very long. I'm going to be covering chapter four of Matt Taibbi's The Divide. I'm reading that right now and I kind of do this regularly. It's kind of like a book club. There it is right there. It's pretty cool. Um, so what I do guys is uh, I do like a poor man's book club. I don't have any money. I don't buy books new. On principle, I don't like buying books new, so a lot of times I go to this like underground bookstore that the library has here, and I can get like five books for a dollar. So if you have any recommendations on political books, or as you guys know, I'm also a horror novelist. If you have any good horror novels or short story anthologies, please leave them in the comments. I love to read, so um, I usually read those comments and go in with like a, a shopping list, and if it happens to be in the the bookstore under the library, I just pick one up. So I did pick this up there, and it's an awesome book so far. This chapter is called The Greatest Train Robbery You Never Heard Of. It's talking about the Lehman Brothers collapse uh, during the 08 financial crisis and uh, what they did, and it was it's insane. Like it's, it's so esoteric what these Wall Streeters did during the subprime mortgage crisis and among other crashes that I would have to spend an hour going over this chapter if I really wanted to do it correctly. And even then, I don't even trust myself to do everything correctly and tell you guys exactly the way it went down in the right order because they did this on purpose. The Wall Streeters made this very, very complicated on purpose so they could get away with basically $5 billion when Lehman Brothers was bought out and saved by Barclays. So rather than do that, I'm going to give you guys a crash course instead and try to keep the episode short. And uh, I'm going to read to you guys about five pages and then talk to you about three or four different things that they did. The first thing that happened, guys, is the Lehman Brothers, under the leadership of a Bond villain-esque type character named Dick Fold, they doubled down on the subprime mortgage crisis when other banks big banks like Chase and I believe Goldman Sachs were actually seeing the writing on the wall and trying to save themselves. And it was this doubling down by Dick Fold, amongst others, at Lehman Brothers, which caused their doom. And by the time he actually stepped down and they realized that they were in trouble, it was too late. They couldn't save themselves. So the last option that they had was to basically sell themselves to the UK bank Barclays which you guys have maybe have seen it. It has like the lion as its symbol. It's supposed to be, you know, a very old bank, stands for stability, and uh, you can trust us with your money, that type of bank. And in the acquisition of Lehman to Barclays, they made $5 billion. So the way that that worked out simply was Lehman was getting $45 billion in cash, in exchange for 50 billion that they were giving in collateral to Barclays. And that five extra billion was the rub. And the way that they were actually able to pull this off, because it's not technically legal to like take a whole bunch of extra assets when a company like Lehman has just declared bankruptcy, it's to avoid things just like this, where, you know, the bank that's acquiring another bank or another financial institution just makes off with a whole bunch of extra money. That, that's why it's in there. But the way that they pulled it off was they came up with this scam in like the third week of September 2008. And I'm going to read to you exactly how that went down, the feverish nature of all these Wall Streeters basically getting into groups and pulling off um, a financial high wire act. But also what they had to do is they had to trick the judge and the auditors, so a financial institution that was independent that was auditing the deal, they had to trick them, and then they had to also trick the judge who was overseeing the deal to okay it at the end because, of course, it wasn't legal for them to take that $5 billion. So that's the best way I can explain it succinctly, guys. If you actually want to read the ins and outs, it is fascinating. This is a good book. Taibi does a great job keeping this not complicated. So I recommend you just read it if you want all the bloody details. But uh, here I'm going to read to you about that feverish weekend where all of these nasty Wall Streeters were getting together in one building and figuring out this huge deal, okay? 
I'm also going to explain to you about how this hurt the common man as well because when Wall Streeters play with money, they're not playing with their own money. They're playing with our money. They're playing with investors' money. Um, it's all gambling for them. They don't really care. It's not theirs. So let me read to you here. When the bad news hit that crucial September weekend, all those creditors, the wine workers' unions and long beaches of the world, had everything riding on companies like Houlihan and Millbank and on Burien in particular. Now, that was the auditor. Saul Burian. He was the one overseeing the deal to see that it was actually a wash because they claimed Barclays and Lehman that it was a wash deal and it was equal, but the five billion, they didn't disclose that. Um, and they were trying to keep Burian in the dark during this entire weekend, you'll see. After all, the best and perhaps only hope to save any value at all for the Lehman creditors was to safely move the cargo off the Lehman Titanic and onto the sturdy balance sheet of Barclays, a storied European bank whose very name carried the soothing implication of soundness, honesty, and old-world stability. But there was a catch. If the deal to sell the Lehman cargo were put together in a way that was lopsided in Barclays' favor, then all those Long Beach firemen and African missionaries and Australian boys clubs and even the sheiks running the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, whose exposure to Lehman was somewhat greater than the mean, an incredible $609 million, would all lose out as there would be less le far less left over for those thousands of creditors to split up. Unfortunately, from the start, the Lehman Barclays deal was an awesomely complicated fix. Again, in the days before its purchase of Lehman's assets, Barclays had quietly hired on all the key Lehman personnel who were involved with evaluating those assets. In, ex assets. in exchange, Lehman deal markers, makers jiggered the numbers of the deal in Barclays' favor to the tr tune of billions of dollars. I also didn't mention, guys... Um, the board of directors at Lehman, when they th were, the morning that they were going in to actually have the meeting about selling to Barclays, they all got anonymous phone calls offering them new deals of what their contracts would look like under Barclays management. And these were the tune of millions of dollars each. So basically what they did is they incentivized all of the board of directors to okay the deal simply by saying, well, when you go to work for Barclays, you're getting a huge raise. And so that's not legal either. They all went in there. No one told each other. None of the board of directors told each other that they had all received phone calls, but they had gotten their palms greased the morning they were supposed to go in and oversee and decide whether or not they were actually even going to sell to Barclays. They've already gotten the job offer to the tune of millions of dollars that they'll get if they do sell to Barclays. You can't do that. So those insiders had spent much of the chaotic week leading up to the, that weekend in the skyscraper negotiating the details of the secret discount. The insiders had smartly already presented the deal to a bankruptcy court without the discount figured in and got the court's approval that Friday afternoon just as Judge James Peck was about to take off for the weekend. The only hint of what was to come was Lori Fife's offhand comment about a clarification letter. And that's, that's key. I'll read to you about that in a minute. The game then moved to Central Park skyscraper offices of White Gottschall, where the insiders would spend that fateful weekend clarifying the approved deal to move billions of extra dollars to the Lehman Barclays insiders. This was the arrangement being hammered out in the rooms from which Burian and the Millbank lawyers were excluded. That's the auditors. They weren't allowed into these um, discussions, even though they were sitting in the or sitting in the lobby the entire time. None of the creditors' representatives had any clue as to what was going on and their panic increased all weekend. Most of the team arrived mid-Saturday. Burian, who is a Sabbath observant, arrived on su uh, after sundown and failed repeatedly to get an audience with anyone involved in the deal. Houlihan and Millbank personnel even camped out strategically in different parts of the building, hoping for a chance to pull someone aside. All weekend long, phones rang and men and women rushed in and out of the conference rooms. Big groups broke into little groups, while little groups scratched out side deals and rushed to rejoin big groups. The main action took place in a huge square-shaped conference room on the 25th floor. From outside that room, Burian said he could occasionally hear spirited discussions going on while officials from the Fed and the Treasury chimed in from a ceiling-mounted speaker system that applied an almost mystical aura to the proceedings. Quote, you could hear, you know, like the voice of God, he said, people on the conference calls coming through the ceiling. But all day Saturday and then most of Sunday passed without the creditors' reps getting anything like a complete answer to a pair of very simple questions. What exactly was Lehman selling to Barclays and for how much? A conference call between the Houlihan and Millbank folks and creditors 
all around the world had been scheduled for noon that Sunday, but that call was bumped to 2, then 4, then 6. Then it was 8 o'clock, then 10, then finally a call actually happened at 11.30 p.m., a call in which Burian had to explain to exasperated creditors in places as far away as Japan that the committee, despite its frantic efforts at calculating the value of the deal, still basically had no idea what the hell was going on, what was in the deal and what wasn't. It wasn't a pretty call, Burian later said. It was after that call, after more stomping around and more stalking of coffee machines, that Burian finally lost it. He approached Harvey Miller, one of Weil and Gottschall lawyers, who was standing outside a conference room where the deal was being negotiated. He told Miller the delay was ridiculous and that it was inconceivable that the largest transaction ever was about to be closed and nobody had time to inform the creditors' committee. Miller sighed, told Burian to wait a minute, and then walked five or six feet to another executive named Michael Klein, who happened to be standing nearby. And this is crazy here, guys. This is some Wolf of Wall Street shit right here, this Michael Klein guy. None of the people on the creditors' committee knew that Michael Klein, as recently as a few weeks before, did not work for either Lehman or Barclays, or even in have an inkling that he might ever do so. In fact, he had been at Citigroup for more than 20 years, from 85 through July 2008, where he held the title chairman of international clients. Barclays CEO Bob Diamond had hired him just over a week before and he would ultimately be paid an incredible sum of ten million dollars essentially for his work on this single deal. Quote unquote, he was a mercenary is how one lawyer described him. Klein was worth every penny. On the Saturday before the sale was completed, Klein personally sent an email to Diamond bragging that he'd found more money to take from creditors and move to the Barclays side of the deal. Quote, unquote, great day, Klein said. We clawed back $3 billion more. So was this Michael Klein, who in the wee hours of Monday, September 22nd, felt a tug in, tug in the skyscraper hallway? Layman lawyer Harvey Miller had tapped his shoulder, whispered in his ear, and pointed to Burian. At the sight of Burian, Klein sagged like he was taking a bullet, but seemed resigned, motioned to Burian to follow him into a conference room. It was inside that conference room that the $10 million man Klein treated Burian and by extension of every firefighter, wine worker, African missionary, and Australian boys club creditor on earth to a demonstration of sheer chutzpah. Klein understood that he was being asked to explain the contours of this gigantic transfer of wealth, not to anyone with real juice on Wall Street, but to the representative of people whose only leverage was that they held a huge stack of paper claims against laymen. So Klein, showing what was apparently all due respect, scanned the room looking for a sheet of paper to write on. His eyes settled on a, a credenza or somewhere on the table where the where there happened to be a, uh, sitting a stack of manila folders. He paused, took one of those folders, and for a few minutes scribbled on it. When he was finished, he showed Burian the following picture. And I, I wish I could show it to you guys. I'm going to explain it to you. Burian stood back in amazement. Michael Klein had essentially diagrammed the biggest asset purchase in the history of finance on a manila folder. It was like submitting a design for a nuclear bomb to the Pentagon via a ballpoint drawing on the back of a napkin. Burian stare, stared at the scribblings. He would testify later that he was awestruck by the moment, overwhelmed by the fact that he was participating in something so historically important. The Manila folder asked the entire universe of layman creditors to accept on faith that the deal that had been reported to the court had changed, but only because the assets being transferred had since lost value in the market. Quote, we were relieved that there was an, arg uh, an agreement, Burian said. As for what the agreement was, he told the negotiators that he believed, of course... He believed them, of course, but that he would have to check it all out later. Still, the absolute certainty with which the deal was explained to him acted like a balm on his nerves. They all seemed so sure of everything. Quote, I turned to all of them and said, if this is what's happening, then so be it, he said. In truth, Klein, in handling that manila folder over, handing that manila folder over, had acted as the getaway driver, the man responsible for delivering the big lie to layman's creditors. The lie was couched in a pair of those feverishly etched lines, pre-mark 49.9 bill, post-mark 44 to 45 bill. So what he's talking about there is that fifth, that 5 billion, 4 to 5 billion, and uh, the difference between what the assets were worth when the deal started and w when they were actually doing this negotiation. So there's more to it than that, and I'm not going to waste any more time. That's the longest uh, thing I'm going to read to you guys today. But as you can see, this was as much cheating and as much a balancing act as you could possibly do on Wall Street. And they pulled the wool over the eyes of the auditor, Burian, 
And then this last part here, I'm just going to very briefly explain how they pulled it over the eyes of Judge Peck via that clarification letter that I was talking to you guys about. The Friday before this all went down, Mrs. Fife, they had explained everything to Judge Peck, and she said right before they were going out on the weekend, there's a clarification letter for just this one last loose end we have to tie up on Monday. We'll get it to you by then. But of course, what's in the clarification clarification letter was everything and even though it was just a paragraph that singular paragraph that was basically hidden within thousands of tens of thousands of pages was exactly what allowed Barclays to take all of this money and they basically pulled a fast one on the judge um, it's called paragraph 13 and then there was one sentence in the like SEC filings or whatever that Barclays put in I'm gonna read that to you here okay so in January 2009, so this is afterwards, they're like um, looking at the deal afterwards. January 2009, A&M, which they're also, they're auditing the deal, A&M, Alvarez and Marshall, formed a team to look into the transaction. They had just started work when they and the rest of Wall Street were hit with a bombshell. Tucked into Barclays SEC filing for the fourth quarter of 2008 was the following sentence regarding the purchase of L the Lehman assets. Quote, the excess of fair value of net assets acquired over consideration paid to Lehman resulted in 2,262 million pounds of gains on acquisition. 2 billion, 262 million pounds was about $4.2 billion at that time. Barclays was announcing to the world that it made more than $4 billion on acquisition of Lehman. That's the first thing. And then this is how they pulled the wool over the eyes of Judge Peck right here. A little bit later. Here we go. The taking of the $5 billion by way of terminating the repo, because they were going to repo all of Lehman's assets, is a perfect example. The idea seems to have come from senior Lehman finance executive Jerry Riley, who wrote to Lowett and Tanucci and others that defaulting on repo could be the best to discount best as discount could be taken from haircut. He said, meaning that Barclays could get paid by wolfing down the excess collateral, quote unquote, the haircut, the difference between the $45 billion loan and the $50 billion in collateral. Kelly later said that, quote, I understand that that was the mechanism. Defaulting on the repo was the mechanism. The actual transfer of securities and cash was through the repo agreements and essentially the termination of those repo agreements. On September 19th, the same Friday when Lori Fife mentioned the clarification letter, Lehman officially filed for bankruptcy. Under bankruptcy law, any bankruptcy calls for an automatic freezing of op uh, any bankruptcy calls for an automatic freezing of all open contracts. This is designed to protect creditors from money owed to them flying out of the dying company. There is a specific exemption for repos, but and this is an important but. If a repo is terminated, the creditor can liquidate the collateral and get repaid, but any excess collateral has to go to the estate. In other words, if Barclays wanted to terminate that repo, it would have the right to liquidate Lehman's collateral, but it, but it could claim only the $45 billion principal of the loan, not the haircut. The excess $5 billion would have to stay in the now bankrupt Lehman Brothers, which means it would have gone to pay other claimants, Long Beach, Wine Workers, and the other 76,000 creditors. By law, there was no way that Barclays could terminate the repo and get all $50 billion. It was entitled to only 45 The excess $5 billion should have gone to Lehman's estate, but it didn't. Instead, Barclays and its lawyers huddled up and came up with an ingenious gambit. The first thing they did is they sent Lori Fife, the Weil and Gottschall lawyer, to Judge Peck's courtroom on Friday afternoon to tell his honor that the deal was basically done, except that they were going to clarify a point or two. This was the after aforementioned clarification letter announcing her actual words, quote, we've clarified in the clarification letter, which we're hoping to finalize and actually present to your honor whenever it comes down here, end quote. The use of the past tense was particularly ingenious since the letter had not actually been written yet. It was written, however, the following day. The key part of this letter was actually drafted by a different firm that Barclays hired, Sullivan and Cromwell, which added the following paragraph 13 of the clarification letter. Now, it's a, it's, it's a little bit of a long paragraph. I'm not going to read it to you because it's super jargon-filled. I'm going to give you uh, Taibbi's synopsis instead. 
Despite its extreme camouflaging dullness, this paragraph is the legal equivalent of a David Blaine act. What it says is that when, ter when we terminated the repo yesterday, well, that didn't actually happen. But we are terminating the repo today, and we get to keep all the excess money. Essentially, paragraph 13 unterminated the terminated repo and then re-terminated it on Barclay's own terms. Ingeniously, lunatic mind loops like this are why one pays certain lawyers $1,000 an hour. The complicated maneuver allowed Barclays to avoid disclosing to the court ahead of the deal that the repo had been terminated and that it had kept the $5 billion. Even more amazingly, it did so without asking Judge Peck's permission. While the judge had discharged them on Friday night before, he had specifically instructed the lawyers on both sides that he was available to be reached all weekend should something important come up. But this decision to unilaterally unterminate the repo and secretly pocket $5 billion apparently didn't rise to the level of something worth calling the judge over. And eventually it did. Uh, Peck allowed it, even though he kind of, uh, because he was kind of embarrassed. Um, and they pulled the wool over his eyes so badly that he just kind of let it go um, with some bogus reasoning at the end. But you get the idea, guys. The Wolf of Wall Street stuff that you see in the movie, that's nothing compared to what these guys are actually doing. Like, I don't want to make it too complicated, and quite frankly, I don't understand it. I don't think anyone on Earth quite really truly understands what these guys do. They just gamble with money. They're, you know, greedy sons of bitches, and they will cheat wherever they possibly can. And that's what I want you guys to take away from this. It was a great chapter, um, but basically that collapse, the collapse of Lehman, and them doubling down in the subprime mortgage crisis when all the other banks got out, that was what caused a lot of the collapse. It was the first domino to fall. You guys may remember seeing them. So I'm sorry that episode still went a little bit long. I think we're just over 20 minutes, but the last episode I did of it was over 40 minutes, so I'll consider that a synopsis. So um, long story short, guys, these Wall Streeters are the filthiest fucking crooks on the planet, and they should all be jailed. Not to mention, we've got the politicians now doing insider trading, like Nancy Pelosi, among others, and making hundreds of millions of dollars off of it when they themselves can legislate and affect the markets. And in fact, they do. Nancy Pelosi routinely beats all of the Wall Streeters in her portfolio. And I don't think that's just because she's a fucking genius. It's because two things happen. She'll either legislate something and then gamble on it, or she knows something's about to be legislated, so she'll invest in it early and then know it's coming down the pipeline and and make sure that that law or that you know thing that she's trying to pass that's going to benefit her gets done that's insider trading martha stewart can go to jail why can't nancy pelosi why can't these wall streeters so um we never jail these people but we do do a fair job jailing people like andrew brown who i talked about in the last chapter black people brown people for doing something as simple as just standing on the sidewalk and impeding pedestrian traffic or jaywalking or loitering or all these bullshit reasons that cops will arrest people of color and poor people and put them in jail or hold them on against their uh, rights on bail. But these fucking guys, none of them ever saw the inside of a jail cell. Not one fucking day. I mean, I think Jordan Belfort from... Uh, I, the, the guy literally from Wolf of Wall Street, but he went to a jail where they have like fucking tennis courts and they, they get served like caviar as their meals. Like this is a rich person jail. That's not real jail. None of these guys went to real jail. So it's bullshit. Um, but I highly recommend picking up the book for yourselves, guys. It's um, Taibbi is a very good writer and uh, keeps things entertaining. And uh, this is a fantastic book so far. Uh, five, five stars so far. So I'll read the next chapter as soon as I can and uh, we'll continue the book club sometime next week. Keep fighting the good fight out there, guys. I'll see ya.